Jack and Nori, Jack and Nori. What's the story, Jack and Nori? Aladdin and the Wonderful Lamp. There once lived a poor tailor who had a son called Aladdin, a careless idle boy who could who would do nothing but play ball all day long in the streets with little idle boys like himself. This to grieve the father, who that he died yet in spite of his mother's tears and prayers, and then did not mend his ways. One day, when he was playing in the streets as usual, a stranger asked him his age. He is not the son of Mustafa, the tailor. I, sir... And so replied Alan, Aladdin, but he died long a while ago. On this, the stranger, who was a famous African magician, fell on his neck and kissed him, saying, I am your uncle. I knew you from your likeness to my brother. Go to your mother and tell him uh, I am coming. Aladdin went home and told his mother of his newly found uncle. Indeed, child, she said, your father had a brother. I always thought he was dead. However, she prepared supper and bade Aladdin seek his uncle. Who came leading wine and fruit? He presently he fell down and kissed the place where Miss Sutter used to sit, bidding Aladdin's mother not to be surprised at having seen him before. As he had been f- not having seen him before, he had been forty years out of the country. He then turned to Aladdin and asked him of his trade, to which the boy hung his head while his father burst into tears. Aladdin, Aladdin was idle and would learn no trade. He offered to take a, a shop for him, a stock of merchandise. Next day he brought Aladdin a fine set of clothes and took him all over the city, showing him the sights and brought him home at nightfall to his mother. He was overjoyed to see his uh, son so fine. Next day the magician led Aladdin into some beautiful gardens a long way outside the city gates. They sat down by a fountain and the magician pulled a cake from his girdle and he divided it between them. Then they varied onward till he almost reached the mountains. Then was so tired he begged to go back. But the magician beguiled him with pleasant stories, led him to spite of himself. At last they came to the two mountains divided by a narrow way. We shall not go no further, said the false uncle. I will show you something wonderful. Only do you only do you gather up the sticks while I kindle all fire. And when it is lit, the magician threw on it a powder he had about him. At the same time, saying some magical words, the earth trembled a little and opened in front of them. Disclosing a square flat stone with a brass ring in the middle to raise it by, Ladin tried to run away, but the magician caught him and gave him a blow that knocked him down. What have I done? What have I done, Uncle? Said he said pitifully, whereupon the magician began, said more kindly, Fear nothing but obey me. Beneath this stone lies a treasure, which can be yours. No one else may touch. It you may must do exactly as I tell you. The word treasure, a lad of his fears, grasped the ring as he told, saying the names of his father and grandfather. A stone came up quite easily and came some steps appeared. Go down, said the magician. At the foot of these steps, you will find an open door leading to three large halls. Touch up your gown and go through them without touching anything, or you die instantly. These halls lead into a garden, five fruit trees. Walk on until you come to a niche in a terrace which stands with a lighted lamp. Pour out the dial that contains and bring it to me. Drew out a ring from his finger and gave it to Aladdin, bidding him prosper. Aladdin found everything as the magician said. Gave us the fruit of the, of the trees, having got the lamp, arrived at the mouth of the cave. The magician cried out in a great hurry, Make haste and give me the lamp. This Aladdin refused to do until he was out of the cave. The magician flew into a wild, a terrible passion, and throwing some powder on the fire, he said something, and stone rolled back into its place. The magician left Persia forever, while I'm plainly sh- showed that he was not uncle of Aladdin, a cunning magician who read his magical books of a wonderful lamp were making the most powerful man in the world. Though he alone knew where to find it, he could only receive it from the hand of another. He picked out the foolish Aladdin for his purpose, telling him to get the lamp and kill him afterwards. For four or two days, Aladdin remained in the dark, crying and lamenting. At last he rubbed his hands in prayer, and so 
doing so, rubbed the ring, which the magician had forgotten to take with him. Immediately, an enormous and frightful genie rose out of the earth, saying, What wouldst thou with me? I am slave of the ring, and will obey thee in all things. And then fearlessly replied, Deliver me from this place. When the earth opened, he found himself outside. As soon as his eyes could bear the light, he went home, but fainted on the threshold. When he came to himself, he told his mother what had passed, and she showed him showed a lamp and fruits he had gathered in the garden. They were in reality precious stones. He then asked for some food. Alas, child, she said, I have nothing in the house. I have spun a little cotton and will go and sell it. Let him bed her keep her cotton, for he, he would sell her the lamp instead. As it was very dirty, she began to rub it. That he might fetch a higher price. Instantly, Hedy's genie appeared and asked what she would have. She fainted away, but Aladdin, snatching the lamp, said boldly, fetch me something to eat. Do you turn with a silver bowl, twelve silver plates, came rich meats, two silver cups, and two bottles of wine. Then Aladdin's mother, when she came to herself, said, Whence comes this splendid feast? Ask but not but I eat, replied Aladdin. Aladdin. So he ate in the breakfast until it was dinner time. Aladdin told his mother about a lamp. She begged him to sell it. I have nothing to do with devils. No, Sir Aladdin, since chance have take, made us aware of its virtues, we will use it, and the ring likewise, which I shall always wear on my finger. While they had eaten all the genie had brought, Aladdin told him, sold one of the silver plates, and so on it till none were left. He had a recourse to the genie, who gave him another set of plates, and thus they lived for many years. One day Aladdin heard an order, and the Sultan proclaimed that anyone was to stay at home and close to shutters. Princess's daughter went to, to and from the bath. Aladdin seized the desire to see her face. It was very difficult, and she always went veiled. He hid himself behind the door of the bath, a peep through a clink. Beautiful lifted a veil, she went in. She looked so beautiful that Aladdin fell in love with her at first sight. He went home and so changed that his mother was frightened. He told her he loved the princess so deeply he could not live without her. He meant to ask her he meant to ask her in marriage for her father. And rather than hearing this, burst out loving. Aladdin at last prevailed. Upon her to go before the sultan to carry his request, fetch a napkin and lay the magic fruits from the charted garden, which sprinkled sparkled and shone like most beautiful jewels. She took these with her to please the sultan, set up out trusting in the lamp. Grand Vizier and the lords of council just gone in as she entered the hall and placed herself in front of the sultan. He looked he ever took no notice of her. She went every day for a week and stood in the same place. When the council broke up the sixth day, the sultan said to the vizier, I see a set of woman in the audience chamber every day carrying something in a napkin. Call her next time. I might find out what she wants next day, a sign for the vizier. She went up to the foot of the throne. And kneeling to the sultan said to her, Rise, good woman, tell me what you want. He hesitated to the sultan. Send away all but the vizier, and bade her speak frankly, promising to forgive her beforehand for anything she might say. She then told him of her, violent, her son's violent love for the princess. I prayed him to forget her, forget her she said. In vain he threatened to do some desperate deed if I refused to go and not ask your majesty for the hand of the mid princess. I pray you forgive not me alone, but my son Aladdin. The Sultan asked Connie what he she had in a napkin, whereupon she unfolded jewels and presented them. He was thunderstruck, and turning, turning to Vazar said, What thou hast, sayest thou? Ought I ought not to bestow the princess on who values her at such a price? Vizier wanted her for his own son. Begged the Sultan be to win her, withhold her for three months, the course of which he hoped his son would try to make him a richer present. The Sultan granted this. I told Aladdin's mother that though he consented to marriage, he could not appear before him again for three months. Aladdin waited patiently for another three months, but after two, elapsed his mother 
going into the city to buy oil found everyone in rejoicing asked what was going on do you not know was the answer that the son of the grand vizier is to marry the sultan's daughter tonight breathless he ran and told Aladdin. who was overwhelmed at first but presently bethought him a lamp he rubbed it a genie appeared saying what is thy will Aladdin replied so then as thou knowest i broke in his promise to me the vizier's son is to have the princess my command is that tonight you bring here the bride and bridegroom. Master, I obey, said the genie. Aladdin then went to his chamber, where, sure enough, at midnight, a genie transported the bread containing the visitor's son. Princess, take this new married man, he said, and put him outside in the cold, and return at daybreak. Whereupon the genie took the visitor's son out of the bed. Leave Aladdin with the princess, fear nothing, Aladdin said to her. You are my wife, promise to me, by your own just father. And no harm shall come to you. Princess was too frightened to speak. I passed the most miserable night of her life with Aladdin, lay down beside her, and slept soundly. At the appointed hour, the genie fetched in the shivering bridegroom, laid him in his place, and transported the bed back to the palace. Presently, the sultan came to wish his daughter good night and morning, and the happy vizier's son jumped up and hid himself. While the princess would not say a word, and was very sorrowful, Sultan sent her mother to her, who said, Who comes? How comes it? Child, you will not speak to your father. What has happened? The princess sighed deeply. I told her mother how during the night I bade him come to a strange house and would have passed there. Her mother did not believe her in his place, but bade her rise and consider it an idle dream. The following night, exactly the same thing happened the next morning. The princess refusal to speak. The soldier threatened to cut off his cut off her head. He then confessed all, bidding him to ask the vizier's son. If he was not so, the sultan told the vizier to ask his son, who owned the truth. Adding that dearly, he, he loved the princess. He'd rather die than for another such faithful knight. I wish to be separated from her. His wish was granted. At the end of feasting and rejoicing. Within the three months is over, Aladdin went to his mother to remind the Sultan of his promise. He stood in the same place as before. The Sultan had forgotten that Aladdin, and once he remembered him, and sent for her. On seeing her poverty, the Sultan felt less inclined than ever to keep his word, asked his vizier's advice who consoled him, consul- c- counselled him to set her so high a value on the princess that a man living could come up to it. The soldier then turned to the lady's mother, saying, Good woman, a soldier must remember his promise. I will remember you mine, but your son must first send me four basins of gold, brimful jewels, carried by forty black servants, led by five white ones, splendidly dressed. Tell him I await his answer. Above Aladdin bowed low and went home, thinking all was lost. He gave him Aladdin a message, adding, He will wait no longer for you to answer. Not so long, mother, as you think, her son replied. I will do no great, I will do a great deal more than that, for the princess. He summoned a genie a few moments. Eighty slaves arrived and filled up the same house and garden. Aladdin made them Set, set them out to the palace, two by two, followed by his mother. It was very richly dressed, and she, with such splendid jewels in the girdles, they were uncrowded to see them, and basins of gold were carried on their heads. They entered the palace, and after kneeling for the sultan, stood in a half circle round the throne, and their arms crossed. Aladdin's mother presented them to the sultan. She hesitated no, no longer. But she said, but said, Good woman, return and tell your son I wait for him. With open arms, he lost no time in telling Aladdin or bidding him make haste. But Aladdin first called a genie. I want a scented bath, he said, of richly embroidered habit. I have a whole surpassing soldiers and twenty slaves to return me. Besides this, six slaves, beautiful dress, await my mother. And lastly, ten thousand pieces of gold in, in purses. The sooner I sent said than done. Prayer and met his house and were sent past the, through the streets, and so was screwing gold as he went. When those who played with him and his children knew him not, he had grown so handsome, grown so handsome. When the sultan saw him, he came 
Now Ritzman would brace him into the hall where the feast was spread, intending to marry him to the princess that very day. But Aladdin refused, saying, I must build a palace fit for her, and took his leave. Once home, he said to the genie, Build me a palace for the finest marble, set from Jasper, a gate, and other precious stone. Really, he should build a small, large hall with a dome. Its four walls of macy, gold, and silver, each having six windows, with Latisse, all except one, would be left unfinished. Must be set with diamonds and rubies. There are these stables and horses, grooms and slaves. Go, see about it. Palace is finished. By the next day, the genie carried him there and showed him all his, his orders faithfully carried out. Wave into the lane the velvet carpet from Aladdin's palace, the Sultan's. Aladdin's mother was dressed herself carefully. I walked to the palace with her slaves, while she he followed her on horseback. The Sultan sent magicians with triumph, trumpets and syllables to meet them, so the air resounded with music and cheers. She was taken to the princess, who saluted her and treated her with great honour. At the night, the princess said goodbye to her father and set out to look on the carpet for Aladdin's palace. With his mother at her side and followed by his hundred slaves, she was charmed at sight of Aladdin and ran to receive her. Princess, he said, blame your beauty for my boldness. If I have displeased you, she told him that, seeing have seen him, she willingly really obeyed her father in this matter. After the wedding had taken place, Aladdin led her into the hall, where a feast was spread. She suffered with him after the which they danced till midnight. Next day, Aladdin invited the Sultan to see the palace. I entered the hall with the eight four and twenty windows with their rubies, diamonds, and emeralds, he cried. It's a world of wonder. There's only one thing that surprises me. Was it by accident that one window was left unfinished? No, sir, by design, returned Aladdin. Will your majesty have the day glory finishing this palace? So the pleased and sent for the best jewellers in the He showed an unfinished window and begged them fit it up like the others. So, ladies and spokesman, we will not find jewels enough. So to an end fetched with soon news, but to no purpose. For a month's time, work well, was not half done. That in knowing that their verse was vain, let them go into their work and carry the jewels back. Did he finish the window at his command? So I was surprised to see the jewels again. I visited Aladdin and showed him the window finished. I saw them embrace him, the venous vizier. Meanwhile, hinting it was a work of enchantment. Let him won the hearts of people by his gentle bearing. He made captain the Sultan's army and won several battles for him. Remained modest and courteous as before. Lived thus in peace and content for several years. But far away in Africa, the magician remembered Aladdin. By his magic arts, discovered Aladdin itself. Instead of perishing, misery in a cave, escaped and married a princess, whom he was living in great honour and wealth. He knew the poor tailor's son would only have accomplished this by means of the lamp, travelled night and day till he reached the city of China, bent on Aladdin's ruin. As he passed through the town, he heard people talking everywhere about a marvellous palace. Forgive my ignorance, he said. Ask, what is this palace you speak of? Have you not heard of palace of Aladdin's palace? Prince Aladdin's palace, reply, the greatest wonder of the world. I would direct you if you have a mind to see it. Magician thanked them him who spoke, and having seen the palace, knew been raised by the genie of the lamp. For half mad with rage, came a half made rage, he told me to get hold of the lamp, and again plunged Aladdin into the deepest poverty. I luckily Aladdin had gone hunting for eight days, which made the magician gave the magician plenty of time. He bought the dozen copper lamps, put them in a the basket, and went to Paris, Paris calling, crying, New lamps for old! But a big jeering crowd, the princess, was in the hall of four and twenty windows, sent a slave to find out what the noise was about, who came back laughing, and so that the princess scolded her. Madam, replied the slave, who could help laughing to see the old fool offering an exchange fine new lamps for old ones? Now the slave, hearing this, said, "This is an old one on the covers. Here, that can be he can have." This is, this was a magic lamp which Aladdin had left there. 
as he could not take it out hunting with him. Princess, who knowing his val- not knowing his value, loved him bend the magician's slave, take it and make it the strange. He went and said to the magician, Give me the new lamp for this. He snatched it, bade the slave take her choice, and made the cheers of the crowd like little did he care. But he left her crying his lamps. And went out the city gates to a lonely place where he remained to fall when nightfall. He pulled out a lamp and rubbed it. The genie appeared and magicians for the command carried him together with a palace and a princess in it to the lonely place a lonely place in Africa. Next morning so him, looked at the window towards the lonely palace and rubbed his eyes. He was gone. He went to the vizier and asked what had become the palace of vizier looked out too was lost in astonishment he again put it down to enchantment and his time the sultan believed him so in thirty men on horseback to fetch a ladder and chains he said him riding home bound him and forced him to go with them on foot the people ever who loved him followed armed to see that he came to no harm carried before the sultan who ordered an executor to cut off his head? The executor made Aladdin uh, kneel down, bade his eyes, and raised his scapular to strike. At that instant, the visitor who saw the crowd had forced their way the courtyard with scaling walls to rescue Aladdin, called the executor to stay his hand. People did look so threatening that the Sultan gave way and ordered Aladdin to be unbound and prodded him in the sight. The crowd. Aladdin now begged to know what he'd done. False wrench, said the Sultan, think come with Deva, and showed him from the window the palace was which his place which his palace had stood. Aladdin was so amazed he could not say a word. Where is my palace and my daughter? demanded the Sultan. For the first I'm not so deeply concerned. But my daughter I must have. You must find her or lose your head. Aladdin begged for forty days in which he'd find her, promising if he failed to return and suffer death, the Sultan's pleasure. Prayer was granted, he went forth sadly for the soldier's presence. For three days he wandered like a madman, about like a madman, asking everyone who came had come to the palace. But only they all laughed and pitied him. But he laughed and pitied him. Came the banks of the river and knelt down to say his prayers, throwing himself in it. So doing so, he rubbed the magic lamp he still wore. The genie, been in the cave, appeared and asked his will. Say you my life, Genie, said Aladdin. Bring my face back. They are not in my power, said Genie. I am only to save the ring. You must ask him for the lamp. Even so, said Aladdin. But thou curse take to the palace. Let me down da- set me down upon my wife's my dear wife's window. He at once vanished of Africa under the window of the princess and fell asleep out of sheer weariness. He wakened by the singing of the birds and of hearts. But later, he lay out plainly that all of his misfortunes were owing to the loss of the lamp, and vainly wondered who robbed it of him. That morning the princess rose early, uh, and she had done done since. She carried out into Africa by a musician, whose company she was forced to endure once a day. She ever treated him so harshly, he dared not live with them together. As he, she was dressing, one of her women looked out and saw Aladdin. Princess ran and opened the window, and a noise she made. So Aladdin looked up. She called him to come to her. A great was the joy of their lovers at seeing each other again. After he had kissed her, Aladdin said, I beg you, Princess, in God's name, before we speak of anything else, or yours, for your own sake and mine, tell me what has come the old lamp. I went and leant on the cornice of the hall of four and twenty windows. When I went hunting, Alas, she said, I'm an innocent cause of your sorrows, and told him of the stranger lamp. Now I know, cried Aladdin, what we must have to thank the mid- African magician for this. Where is a lamp? He carries it all about with him, said the princess. I know, for he pulled it out of his breast to show me. He wishes me to break my faith for you, marry him, saying that you will be beheaded by my... You be, be, you were beheaded by my father's ha- command. He is forever telling ill of you. I only reply to my tears. I resist, I doubt, no doubt, but he will use violence. And I then confronted, confronted her. Comforted her. I left her for a while. He changed clothes with the first person he met in the town, having sport of certain powder. Concerned to the princess who led him to small or to buy a little slide door. Put on your most beautiful dress, he said to her. We see the magician with smiles, leading him to believe you have forgiven him. Invite him to sup with you.
May you wish to taste the wine of your, of your of his country. You'll go for some. While he's gone, I'll tell you what to do. She listened carefully to Ladin. Then she left. When he left, she arrayed herself gaily for the first time since she left China. She put on a gold on headdress of diamonds and seeing in a glass, she was more beautiful than ever. We see the magician saying to his great amazement, I have made up my mind that Ladin is dead, and all my tears will not bring him back to me. I was old to mourn no more. I therefore invite you to sup with me. But I am tried of the wines of China, and I would fain taste those of Africa. Magician flew to his cellar. The princess put the powder lead and given her in the cup. When he returned, she asked him to drink to her health. The wine of Africa handed him the cup in exchange for his, a sign and she was gold we could sold to him. For drinking a mission made a speech to praise of her beauty. But Princess cut him short, saying, Let us drink first, and you shall say what you want will afterward. He set up the cup to her lips and kept it there, and while the tradition drained his to begs and fell back lifeless. A prince they then opened the door to Ladin, flung her arms around his neck. Ladin put away, bidding her for leave him. As he did one more, he had more to do. He then to the dead magician, took the lamp of his vest, and by the degree he carried the palace and full ill went back to China. This was done, the princess in the chamber, I too only felt two little shocks, and little thought she was at home again. Sultan was sitting in his closet, Morning for his lost daughter, happened to look up and rubbed his eyes, and stood in palaces before. He hastened to tither, and then received him in the hall of four and twenty windows. Princess at his side, and then told him that it had happened, and showed him the dead body of the magician. But he may believe a ten days' feast was proclaimed. It seemed as if Aladdin might lived the rest of his life in peace, but it was not to be. The African magician had a younger brother, who was, if possible, more wicked, more cunning himself. He travelled to try and avenge his brother's death, and went to visit the pious woman named Fat- called Fatima, thinking she might be to the use of him. He entered his cell and clapped a dagger to her breast, telling her to rise, rise and do his bidding of pain and death. He changed clothes of her, coloured his face like hers, put her veil and murdered her, as she might not tell no tales, then went to war the palace of Ladin, and the people, thinking he was a holy mother, gathered around him, kissing his hands and blessing, begging his blessings. He got to the palace, there was such a noise going around him. The palace says, bade her slave, look out the window, ask what was the matter. The slave said it was a holy woman curing people by a touch of their ailments. Whereupon the princess, who had long desired to see Fatima, sent for her. A seeing coming to the princess, the magician offered up a prayer for her health and prosperity. When he had done, the princess made him sit by her, and begged him to stay with her always. Poor Fatima, who wished for nothing better, consented, but kept her vow down for fear of her discovery. The princess showed him all the hall, and asked him what he thought of it. It's very beautiful, truly beautiful, said Fat Force Fanta. I am only once one thing, and what is that? said the princess. It's only a rock's egg, replied. I hung up by the middle of the dome. It would be the wonder of the world. And this the princess could think of nothing but a rock's egg. When Aladdin returned from hunting, he found her a very ill tempered humour. He begged to know what was amiss, he told him, but all the pleasure in the hall was boiled for the want of rock's egg hanging from the dome. Is that all, Sir I replied, Aladdin? You shall soon be happy. He left her and rubbed a lamp, and when the genie appeared, commanded him to bring a box egg. A genie gave such a loud and terrible shriek. Whole shock. Wrench, he cried. It's not enough that I have done everything for you. You must command me to bring my master and hang him out of the midst of his dome. You and your wife and your palace reserves would be burnt to ashes. But this this request does not come from you, but from your brother, the African magician, who you destroyed. It is now that your punished disguise as your holy woman, whom you mur- whom he murdered. It is he who put the wish into your wife's head. Take care of yourself, for he means to kill you. So saying, the genie disappeared. Adam went back to the princess, saying his head ached, and requesting the holy Fatima should be fetched to lay her hands on it. But when the magician came near, led him seizing his dagger, pierced into the heart. What have you done? cried the princess. You killed the holy woman. Not so, replied Aladdin. 
by the wicked magician and told her how she had been deceived. After this, Aladdin and his wife lived in peace. He succeeded the Sultan when he died, reigned for many years, leaving behind him a long line of kings.